Good evening. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Westerkerk. Welcome to Amsterdam, because some of you came from afar. Uh, welcome to this event celebrating and exploring uh, the curious facts, the curious uh, episodes that transpired 400 years ago, linking the Netherlands and America, North America, and later the United States. My name is Russell Shorto. I'm the director of the John Adams Institute. Um, we have an unusual program for, uh, for us, for the John Adams Institute this evening. It's a, in the nature of a town hall meeting. And um, can everyone hear me? I'm being... Uh, can... Uh, could... Perhaps? What we have this evening is a town hall meeting format. There are a lot of people, a lot of distinguished uh, speakers uh, who we would like to hear from, so I will get right to things. First, however, I don't want to forget to thank some of the organizations that made this possible. NY400, the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the City of Amsterdam, ECON, the U.S. Embassy, the Holland America Friendship Foundation, and the Henry Hudson 400 organization. This is a remarkable year and we are now well into it. What we are going to do is a town hall meeting which involves a lot of uh, participation from uh, panelists and from all of you who, we, who uh, would like to take part. And I would like, uh, without any further ado, to introduce, uh, to introduce our moderator who is well known to many if not all of you as one of the country's most distinguished television journalists, Tuan House. Hello, good evening. Um, as Russell said, it will be a town hall meeting like we maybe saw yesterday in Luxembourg with uh, Barack Obama. Only, he only took six questions, I heard, and we're going to take more, right? Yeah. Well, we don't have an Obama here. So. Okay, well, you never know. Maybe Frans Timmermans is running up. Uh, he's one of the guests. I wanted to ask you, maybe everybody knows already here, but uh, why did you pick this day, the 4th of April? Why is it historically significant? It's not a coincidence. Uh, this is, it was exactly 400 years ago today that Henry Hudson left Amsterdam, sailed north to Tessel, the island on the North Sea, and from there, eventually, it's a longer story than that, eventually made his way to America, sailing on behalf of the Dutch, and a great deal of history flowed from that fact. Yes. So uh, you are here, and I would say that um, this whole history of New Amsterdam was almost forgotten and was brought back to life by your research that you did for your book, uh, The Little Island in the Central Duel. That's what I think. No, I, no, I, I wouldn't say that. But it's a, it's a forgotten a history that's forgotten uh, is is waiting for the next generation that needs it. That's that's my uh, approach to history. Uh, every generation takes a different view on history, which is why history is always alive and, and why uh, people continue to write books seemingly on the same subject, because they, they look at it, if you turn it upside down and look at it from another direction, uh, it, it reveals different things. And I think that is the case, the way America has long told its, uh, the story of its founding within, as, as an English event needed to be corrected. It's not going to be a stuffy or boring evening. There are microphones here. I see at least two. Anybody who wants to ask questions to uh, the people here on stage, feel free to do so. Uh, we'll start off with a lecture of you and Geert Mark, and then there are more guests from the Netherlands and from New York as well. Who did you invite for this evening? Uh, we have invited first Frans Timmermans, who is the uh, Minister for European Affairs for the Dutch government, and he has been really a leading force uh, on the Dutch side in making sure that both countries uh, understand and appreciate what this what this year means. We have Marjorie Ames, the U.S. Consul General. We have from uh, New York City, we have Sam Roberts, the New York Times reporter, and Beth Fertig, who is a uh, WNYC radio reporter. And we've got Ruth Oldenziel, who uh, is well known to many of you as one of this country's leading Americanists, uh, uh, stu students and observers of America. And so it should be a, a very uh, fruitful exchange. And WNYC is here as well. The Radio. Uh, I, I mentioned. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't listen. Yeah, it starts off well. Okay, uh, without further ado, uh, Russell, you're going to do the first uh, speech, and after that, uh, Geert Mark. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Tuan. Uh, it's a little unusual because what we decided that we would do is present the history first, and we would present it from an American perspective and then from a Dutch perspective. And uh, the man who is to my left uh, also needs 
no introduction yet in a few minutes I, I will introduce him um, and since I am already standing here I thought I would go first and give the American perspective on what all this means as I said exactly 400 years ago Henry Hudson an Englishman set sail from Amsterdam uh, one of the curious one of the things that people find curious about this whole um, uh, 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 connection between the Dutch and the Americans is that it was an Englishman who was responsible for it. Simply put, Hudson had been a ship's captain sailing on behalf of an English company called the Muscovy Company for many, many years. Uh, and he was, history often turns on, I think, on particular individuals and, court and, and uh, bundles of events. And I think if Hudson is one of those, then he is one that himself really looks backward. He is a figure of the Renaissance. He's a man who, in the, uh, in the, in the early 1600s, had one goal, and that was to find a shortcut to the riches of Asia. That was his, his entire uh, uh, obsession in life. And I think you, you have to read between the lines when you do history, but I think obsession is maybe not too strong a word. He had tried in the previous years several different routes on behalf of the English. He tried to find several different routes for this shortcut. Most uh, outrageously, from our perspective, he tried the year before, in 1608, to sail straight north, right over the North Pole. On the theory, there was a theory at the time that because the sun shone six months of the year on the pole, that if you broke through the outer layer of ice, when you got to the pole, it would be warm and sunny and almost tropical. Um, he, he proved that uh, to be incorrect. Uh, 1609, the, the English, for reasons that we don't understand, the English decided that they had given up on him. The Dutch ambassador in London heard about this, immediately approached him and said, come to Amsterdam, we'll back you. So Hudson came here, he went to the East India headquarters on the Kloveniersburg Hall, and they said that they would back his voyage. He was, Hudson was a, a, a uniquely uh, willful man, and he must have given them a lot of difficulty because they wrote into his contract, he will think of finding no other route than the one they wanted, which was to go northeast around Russia. He, he began that in a very small wooden ship with a crew of about 16. He uh, got, got uh, locked into an area of ice and snow, and he decided in that ha uh, harrowing moment to change course. He turned around and brought his ship across the Atlantic Ocean, following another theory, which was that the North American continent, it was believed, was much smaller than it actually is. And it was believed that there was some sort of channel that cut through it, so that if you went through this channel, instead of reaching what, say, is in fact the state of Ohio, you would come out in the Sea of Japan. So the knowledge of the, of the scope of the Earth's size was wrong. Again, Hudson was spectacularly wrong, but with interesting uh, historical consequences. He, uh, he, he sat, traveled across the Atlantic. He first reached the Delaware River, thought that might be this, uh, this channel. It proved not to be the case. It's a, it's a very shallow river. He couldn't travel very far up it. He went further north and he came to what later became known as New York Harbor and the Hudson River. And he thought that that was, in fact, this channel. And uh, they, they traveled a long ways up the river before finally realizing that, in fact, it was a river, not a, cha not a, a sea channel. They turned around and went back to Europe. Hudson had other uh, adventures. He eventually died the next year uh, when his crew mutinied on him. And, uh, so, but, but Hudson always pursued this vision that, that th what mattered for him was finding a short route to Asia, and to him, North America was an obstacle. However, immediately in his wake, as news of what he had found came back to the Dutch Republic, it excited ripples of interest in different layers of society. People heard about the, the products, the trees, the, the, the animals, the, the furs, this vast land to be exploited. And they set out these uh, um, small ventures to explore it. By 1623, 1624, 1625, this had coalesced. The West India Company was formed. The East India Company had been formed to exploit the East Indies, to exploit Asia and that had worked spectacularly well and in fact 
that had begun to rebuild the landscape of Amsterdam. The cityscape of Amsterdam is in fact uh, a, a lasting testament to how well the work of the East India Company proceeded. The idea was that the West India Company would do the same thing in the Western sphere, in the Atlantic Ocean, West Africa, the Caribbean, South America, North America. And so it was formed with the idea of, with, with two objections. One was to prosecute the war against Spain. The Netherlands was in the middle of its 80-year war against the Spanish Republic, and to get rich. Hudson was, uh, Hudson's whole goal was, was, uh, was made possible because he had exploited a, a niche in this, in this war. There was a 12-year truce. When that truce ended, the, the war was back on, the West India Company formed, and the colony of New Netherland formed with its base on the island of Manhattan. The colony has been neglected by American history and by Dutch history for various reasons. By American history, I think, because it eventually was taken over by the English and there is the old saw that history is written by the winners. By the Dutch, I think it's been ignored because the West India Company never worked and the East India Company worked so very well. So you always naturally look to uh, your successes. However, it is not the case that this colony was insignificant. It existed, depending on how you want to define terms, from 1609 until 1664, when the English took over. They renamed New Amsterdam, New York. Uh, the city of Beverwijk up the river was changed to Albany. And uh, the English period began. In that, in that time period, though, the Dutch transported, I think, two critical ideas to this, this uh, New World landscape. The first was the Dutch, Dutch approach to free trade, which was quite different from the English approach, and which, once the West India Company gave up its monopoly, it allowed for trading houses here in Amsterdam to send one of their sons to New Amsterdam to develop trade, so that you had trade uh, going between the two countries where in, in, in the old country they wanted, most, most of all, they wanted animal pelts, beaver pelts, and they wanted tobacco. The people in the New World, of course, wanted civilization. They wanted spoons, and they wanted lace, and they wanted china, and uh, so that's, that, that was the nature of the, uh, of the trade. The other thing, the second thing that was brought was this Dutch notion of tolerance, which is much, uh, I think, much misunderstood it was a real thing, but I don't think it was uh, a particularly grand ideal for the most part. These were the low countries. It was an easy place to flee to from other parts of Europe, an easy place to invade. Um, and so Dutch cities had high concentrations of minorities. The, uh, the, when, when this country then founded a colony in the New World, these things came along, not in any grand way, but because that was part of, part of the landscape. So that in Manhattan, in New Amsterdam, New Amsterdam, you had 18 languages being spoken at a time when there were only about 500 people there. So you might say that even before it was New York, it was New York City. Uh, it, and, and, so, so, and, and I would even go further and say that these two ingredients, the, the, this notion of tolerance and this approach to free trade are the two bases of modern society. These are, this, this is commonplace now. In any, uh, any place in, in the, the Western world looks at these things as, as, as a ground. So you had then the, the old world um, um, breeding ground of this spawning a new world breeding ground of, it, of this. And I think that's what you saw develop in New, York, in, in New Netherland and in New Amsterdam and when the English took over, they kept it. They kept this in place because it worked. It worked, and they allowed it to work in a way that was different from the way Boston developed and other parts of British North America. And I would go further and say that in, la in later centuries, when the great waves of immigrants came from Europe to North America, by and large, they arrived in New York Harbor. They arrived in the streets of Manhattan. They saw this teeming mixture of peoples and languages and they saw them all trading and trying to get ahead, and they took this in and assumed that this was America. This was what America was about. And then they moved westward. They moved to New Jersey, to Ohio, all the way to California, and they brought this with them. So I think in that way, th that is how this notion spread, how these seeds 
from this place were transported across the ocean and spread and grew into something uh, quite different. And that, I think, is what we are celebrating here and what this whole year of 2009 is celebrating. That, in, in short summary, is an American perspective on what we are doing here. I would now like to introduce to you, to give you a Dutch perspective on it, uh, one of the Netherlands' leading writers, most read writers, uh, someone whose work has uh, been translated into I don't know how many languages, who has written, of course, uh, very well-regarded books about Amsterdam, which have opened the eyes of the Dutch and of people around the world. And uh, more recently, his volume in Europe and the documentary series uh, based on it were a highly personal walk through the Europe of the 20th century, and he's, uh, I think, one of this country's most important voices, Gert Mack. Thank you very much, Russell. Early this morning, it was foggy around the Schreier's Toren, and if you forgot for a moment the noise of the traffic and the trains, you could imagine for a second how it was on that spot today, exact 400 years ago. It could have been the same kind of weather, and where the central station now stands was a long strip of old jetties, rotting bollards, wooden, wooden watch houses, and somewhere behind that exotic transition area, half city, half sea, danced a modest ship, a triple masted yacht of 26 meters, the half a man. So it began. The rest of the story we know. In my earliest memories, only one thing is left, wrote John Adams, the perception that art, science, and the empire always moved westbound. That was a typical 18th century remark. Uh, but that it was, in fact, a movement that started already more than a century before Hudson left for his famous voyage. It is interesting to realize that, earlier still, China knew also a short period of discovery expeditions. In the beginning of the 15th century, the Chinese Admiral Zheng organized, like a Chinese Hudson, but then much bigger, seven big expeditions around the Pacific. And we presume that he explored the west coast of South America and probably also North America. That was 87 years exactly before Columbus. So the Chinese had also the skills and the possibilities to do these kind of things. However, and that is the big difference, immediately after Zheng's discoveries, the Chinese deliberately turned away from outward exploration while Europe embarked on a still ongoing project of westernizing, if the Europeans could, the entire globe. Like Farid Zakaria is explaining in his latest book about the rise and fall of the West, from the 16th century, Western Europe dem demonstrated the power of practical, um, economically rational thinking. The key, he says, was social learning. Discoveries once made were not forgotten, but refined and developed. Other civilizations know, like the Chinese, sorry, other civilizations knew, like the Chinese, the process of discovery and forgetting again. It happened also in the ancient world, for instance. In Western Europe, however, the idea of permanent discovery and renewal became, from the 16th century, the leading idea. The hundred years between 1450 and 1550, writes Zacharia, marked the most significant break in human history between faith, ritual and dogma, on the one hand, and observation, experimentation and critical thought, on the other hand. And it happened in Europe pushing that civilization forward for centuries. And I add here, too, to it, 
It happened above all in this outpost of modernity, at the break between the 16th and 17th century in the, at that time, amazing city of Amsterdam. Of course, it was in a period, all Dutchmen remember that from their school years, it was in a period of change in which theological struggles in all their pettiness were fought out and also in a time when the God-fearing citizens gave themselves the right to exploit every other creature without mercy. The Dutch merchants earned gold with the slave business. But it was also a time which opened on all kinds of fields new worlds. It was a time in which the human ratio suddenly got wings. A time in which the Australian-American coastlines were explored, but also the first microorganism. It was the beginning of the century in which slowly the idea took root that the human fate not only was, is, give, is governed by uh, how or, uh, sorry, is governed by higher powers, but also by man himself. The nature lost its overwhelming power, could be perhaps even be subjected, and that gave a key to a new mode of progress and optimism. These were the starting points of the so-called 17th century Dutch Enlightenment, which was embodied by philosophers like Spinoza. In the same time, especially in the first half of the 17th century, was this whole ambition still put in a kind of religious context. It was in all its, its humanity still fixed in a cosmic divine order. The main task of every explorer in the big world and also in the micro world, world was above all the discovery of the secret harmony of that divine order. Look for instance at the so-called Burgerzaal in the palace on the dam, the old town hall of the 17th century Amsterdam. The whole world, the whole cosmos is there at your feet. But in the same time, the building is strictly built in what the people saw in that time, in the divine harmonious proportions. This was the new modern mood which became, I, Russell said it already, a kind of obsession, not only for Henry Hudson, but also for people like Petrus Plantius, Dirk van Os, and other people behind this expedition. So, when we think tonight about this enterprise, seen from that perspective, what were then the effects on the long term, especially in the relation between the old and new Amsterdam, later New York? There was Russell Shorto said it already, in the first place, of course, the physical colonization and city building, or town building, you can better say, on Manhattan itself. I will only mention one incident in that relatively short Dutch period, the so-called Flushing Remonstrance. It was already said that this uh, new Amsterdam of Mr. Peter Stuyvesant was a city with a lot of minorities, a lot of nations, but one minority was not liked at all. That were the Quakers, now very nice, quite pacifistic people, but in that time they had uh, the name uh, uh, to be very rebellious and difficult. So in 1657, Governor Peter Stuyvesant, Stuyvesant decided to accept, uh, sorry, he decided not longer to accept Quakers in his colony. He put one of the leaders in prison, tortured him a little bit, and made also a an, 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 an kind of law that it was forbidden to uh, 
uh, hide Quakers and to help them and to give them food in any way. And when someone tried to do that, he would also, they wanted also to, he wanted also to throw them out of the colony. At that moment, and it was a very interesting moment, a few dozen citizens of the young town Vlissingen, nowadays a uh, kind of, uh, yeah, what is it? Uh, now a kind of suburb, Flushing, but in that time it called really Vlissingen, they decided to send a petition to Stuyvesant in which they referred to their brand new city constitution which promised everybody freedom, freedom of religion and conscience. It was a very, uh, very exceptional act because these uh, citizens of Flushing, Flissingen were not Quakers at all themselves. The, it was not their personal interest, uh, but they, 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 they had the idea that they had to defend the basic principles of their new society. If any of these sad persons, they meant the Quakers, they wrote, come into love to us, we cannot in conscience lay violent hands upon them, but give them free egress and regress into our town. For we are bound by law of God and man to do good until all men and evil to no man. On the Dutchman Stuyvesant, these beautiful words didn't have any effect. In, in, he put also the peop some people from Flushing also next to the Quakers into prison. But in Flushing, the Quakers kept coming. And at the end, one of the colonists from Flushing went to Amsterdam to be heard by his highest bosses under God, and that were the elder men of the West Indian Company. And the West Indian Company made a very uh, interesting uh, decision. They said that the Quakerism was indeed an uh, abominable godsdienst, and Abby, no, no, sorry, my English is not so fantastic. Uh, Abby, no, mebel, uh, re, sorry, religion, you understand. But Stuyvesant's, Stuyvesant's decisions were quashed. Everybody in the colony had right to, uh, to have its own religion. There are historians, American historians, who think that the beginning of the American freedom of religion is laid at that flushing petition, this flushing remonstrance on that decision on 27th of December 1657. And I think they are right. And more, with this petition, the Americans took over the typical Dutch way of pacifications between different religions, not by expelling religious minorities which was the normal practice in Europe in that time, but by tolerating them. That was really very modern. And to give them their own place in the society. America became, in that way, just like later, later the, Nederl the Netherlands, a very religious country without explicit cho choosing for one dominating religion. A second interesting moment of interaction between the Dutch and the Americans occurred around the Declaration of Independence in 1776. There is more than one indication that the American founding fathers were particularly inspired by the Dutch rebellion against the Spanish king at the end of the 16th century. The Dutch founded, after all, with exception of a few Italian city-states, the first republic in the world. And it was not more than logic that the Americans looked very closely to that historic experiment they were on the verge to follow. So the founding fathers studied, for instance, the text of the so-called Plakkaat of Verlatingen very closely. They've they also were, just like the Dutch Geuzen, in some way overwhelmed by their own revolution. Everything went very quick and also in that way they looked very close at the Dutch revolution. And they were also, just like the founders of the Dutch Republic, no aristocrats but just citizens. 
very talented citizens, but also citizens who no, wouldn't have any chance to become leading politicians in typical aristocratic society like Great Britain or France. Of, of course, the American Revolution was in a lot of ways influenced by the French Enlightenment. But everywhere in American society, you find also traces of this earlier Dutch Enlightenment, especially when you look at the relation between state and religion. The French system puts a strict line between state and religion. An inauguration of a French president with a reverend, a Bible and a state prayer, like we witnessed again last January, would be unthinkable. In the Netherlands, however, a kind of state prayer, especially in smaller city towns, were not unusual till a few decades ago. The relation between state and religion was here always a little bit confused and confusing. But there was, and there was never a clear distinction between these two like in France. The Dutch imaginated community was, in other words, never total secular. And after the Flushing Remonstrance and the Declaration of Independence, the USA followed that line. With the declarations of independence, we see also the start of a new kind of relation. I call it, I call it the echo effect, a new eastbound stream of ideas and creativity between these two countries. We all know that the Dutch Patriot Revolution, which was in, at the end of the 18th century, which was in fact the beginning of the modern centralized state of the Netherlands we know now, was strongly influenced by the political and revolutionary movement in France. Nevertheless, we must realize that there was also a strong influence on the Patriots from the, from the new born new SA. The patriotic leader, Jan Dirk van der Capello, was a close friend of John Adams. And their exchanges in letters are still very interesting to read. In 1781, van der Capello published, uh, inspired by the rebellions, uh, the, the, by the rebellions, uh, by the American rebellions, uh, anonym, an anonymous pamphlet under the title To the People, of the Netherlands. In real revolutionary language, he called on the Dutch to free themselves from the old aristocratic, let's say, uh, let's say from the old rep Republican elites and to build a new democratic order built on the freedom of press. We all talk, and I think we will do it tonight again, about the freedom of press in the Netherlands in the 17th and 18th century, but I can tell you there were a lot of exceptions, and it was not by coincidence that Van der Capelle at the end of the century, 18th century again asked for freedom of press. But interesting again is when you read Van der Capello, Van der Capella, he is just like you see now Dutch politicians, politicians talking about Obama. He is all the time referring and talking to this American revolution. So this patriotic revolution was not only a French revolution. It was, in my opinion, even more an Atlantic revolution and an Atlantic movement. In the 19th century, this feeling of togetherness with the USA developed in a total other side of the Dutch society. I, I must say, more, the more, at the more conserv conservative, pietistic and traditional Calvinistic part of the society. For them, the Christian state culture of the USA was a kind of yeah, a, 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 a fantastic thing, a, a kind of a dream. They was, were disappointed in the Netherlands. They thought for centuries that the Netherlands were a kind of Zion, a kind of new Israel, and they were the children of Israel. They were dis disappointed in the Netherlands, but they saw at the other side of the ocean this new Israel coming. And with ten thousands, they moved to the United States uh, and uh, they were often Puritans, they were 
a lot of pietists, there were also very strong Calvinists, and I'm sure uh, their immigration in the United States has influenced the special American way of religion, and also the, the, the pietistic and uh, part of the American religion, on a way more than we can imagine. There is some connection between the immigrants which Thomas Rosenbaum described, the immigrants from Hogeveen, and the ideas of Mrs. Sarah Paling. <laughs> also here, you see a kind of echo effect, because these religious immigrants felt in some way in the United States still the roots of the 17th century republic, the 17th century Netherlands, and uh, uh, they, they found them, they, 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 it echoed back to the Netherlands and then it went back to the United States. Enough to talk, and uh, I think enough to, to discuss about. Only one last observation. I said it already, I walked this morning around the Schreierstor and I saw this, uh, this, this beautiful, uh, miraculous uh, plaquette uh, was, which was placed in 1927. Uh, it was a miraculous thing when you look closely because you see there the Halve Maan for instance and at the background you see the Souder Kerk. But I'm sorry to say the Souder Kerk was just built years after uh, 1609. So uh, it, it, there was a little it was really uh, miraculous. <laughs> and uh, also the Schreier's Toren, uh, it was not, of course not called Schreier's Toren because all the women were crying and Henry Hudson was crying, not at all. It was just called Schreier's Toren because it is just at a sm sharp corner, a Schreier corner we call it in Old Dutch. And that's the reason this tower is called in that way. And at last, I, I'm sorry I have to disappoint you. Uh, uh, but uh, we are almost sure that he did not leave from the Schreier store because it was a practical, almost impossible to set sail there, but a little bit further on that. But this all details. <laughs> uh, it, is, it is not important at all. But it tells something about the subjectivity of history, uh, about the uh, truth and about uh, sometimes also about the myth we tell each other. And it tells something about the stories we don't tell, about the silences, the gaps in our history. Who owns the history? That is an eternal question and an eternal battle. This story tonight, I told you, is just like this plaquette, our history written and told from New York and from Amsterdam, our own history. But we have to keep in mind, and especially on this occasion, that it is not the history. There is another side on all the nice exploration of the, our 17th century and other people in other countries and with another background have other stories to tell, totally other stories and also true. Let's never forget that. Thank you very much. Let's see if uh, there are any questions, but before that, Russell and Geert, I would like to ask you, um, I had the chance to sail on a replica of the Halve Man uh, half a year ago in uh, New York, and there was a debate on the... Is Henry Hudson uh, a great captain, or is he a nautical failure because he never found his way to the east and in the end as some of the end as some of you maybe know he was um, put on a little boat on a ship by um, a, a mutiny there was a mutiny on a ship and he died somewhere freezing on the Atlantic near the Canadian coast I think so was he a failure or was he a great captain um, <laughs> no I think he, the, the same reason why he uh, had this obsession he was a very difficult man. I, I, you, you know more about him, but I saw when well, I was writing this Dutch 
part of the story I found also uh, uh, letters from, for instance, the uh, chamber of the VOC in Zealand who, who were already complaining about them, their colleagues, who can you make a deal with this man? Uh, uh, he, he, he was already problematic before he set sail. He had a very bad name. But because he was so stubborn, he had also uh, he was also so crazy that he really wants to explore this North Pole and so and so. But this stubbornness, the same character is my idea, was also at the end the reason he 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 went too far. He couldn't get his people in his hand anymore. I think that uh, any ship's captain would probably say that you know a captain who's who ends up w in mutiny and and freezing to death uh, was a failure. However, Chip Reynolds, who is the captain of the replica Half Moon, he's his hero. So go figure. Yes, he's a big fan of yeah. uh, Henry Hudson. Are there any questions after we have listened to Russell Shorter and Geert Mark? Or you want to save them for uh, after the next speaker? Okay, let's go then to, um, in Nederlands uh, we say the Staatssecretaris for Europese Zaken, in English Minister of, for European Affairs and the coordinator for uh, this uh, Henry Hudson year, but the official title is NY400, New York 400. Frans Timmermans, welcome to the stage here. Good evening. Um, I hope you all share the fascination for the stories we've just been told. And I'll try and draw my own conclusions from, from these, these histories. And if I sum it up, and if I compare the two countries and the two cities and the two histories, the parallel I see is that both nations share this incredible zeal for liberty, they share this craving for opportunity, and they share this, I would say, passion for morality in many, many forms. One of this being religious, another perhaps a passion for tolerance, etc. These three elements are, I think, part of our history. And if you look at history, good and bad, I'm really challenged by what, what Geert Mark said in his final words. And you look at the decisions made by people who thought they founded everything they did on morality, like the people of the companies here in Amsterdam. And you then see that, for instance, in the 17th century, if they wanted to be successful, once Spain defeated Portugal and they had to produce their own sugar. They had to enter the slave trade. They had to be, slavery needed to be part of their world. And you see that perhaps they have one or two days of conflict. But then they say, well, we need to make that money. Let's go into slavery. And also, if you look at the founding fathers of, of the United States and you see their writings, it's, it is, I mean, I've, I've developed such a passion for what they've written. I've developed such a passion for the deliberations and for this coming into being of the United States. But even a, a great, great man like Thomas Jefferson depended for his livelihood on 200 slaves. And I think if, you, if we really want to look at the history and the common history, we should never avoid these dark pages of our history. And we should, we should use New York 400 also to look at that part of our history. Now, I'm not an historian. And before I say any more, that might be um, called abominable by Geert Mack. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll try and concentrate on, on today and tomorrow. I, if you look at these three basic um, opportunities, basic ideas that we share, Americans and, and Dutch, and if you look also at this phenomenal parallel between these two cities, New York and Amsterdam, you could not imagine the United States without New York. But New York is very atypical in the United States. Holland is unimaginable without Amsterdam. But Amsterdam is a very typical, atypical city in Holland. And these are also very interesting parallels we need to, uh, we need to look at during this year. But what I'm trying to do with this year is to create, again, this feeling that if we really put our minds to it, we can build great things. And I think this is very necessary in this year, because if you look at the challenges we face as societies, if you look at the debate we're having in Dutch society on identity, on freedom of speech, or other issues, or diversity, 
And if you take the trouble to look back into history and to see the parallels with the coming into being of the United States, these things happen time and again also in the United States, although today we seem to forget this. Look at how, uh, what happened to the Japanese community during the Second World War or what happened to the Chinese community at the end of the 19th century or, or even how Protestants reacted to this huge Catholic immigration of Irish and Germans in the 1830s. I mean, all these things, if you look back at them, you can see that if you put your minds to it, you can solve these problems, you can solve these issues, and you can make sure that people find their way in the new societies. And this is why I have, I'm so passionate about this year. And there's an, another very political reason. If you look at the challenges we face, if you look at the need to restructure this world, a need that is becoming more apparent day by day, there is no way we can challenge, we can tackle climate change. There is no way we can tackle the financial crisis, the economic crisis, the food crisis, any other crisis, if we don't agree across the Atlantic. The United States cannot solve these issues on its own. Europe cannot solve these issues on its own. So we are destined to look for solutions together. And this is best done if we understand the basis upon which we operate. And this we can look for again during New York 400. And that is why I feel so passionate about this and I'm looking forward to a lively debate. Thank you very much. It's always difficult to ask the first question, so uh, if anybody, anybody feels like it, the two microphones are there. If, if not, then I would like to ask somebody a question. Could you please stand up? Yes? Tony Afreshnon, that's your name, right? Maybe you should introduce yourself, or uh, maybe you can out, come out here, because one uh, very important historic fact is forgotten maybe in all this, and you are the representative of that. Could you introduce yourself to the audience here? Yes. I'd be happy to. My name is uh, Tanya Ganella Frischner. I'm from the Onondaga Nation, which is located in upstate New York. I'm a citizen of that uh, territory. Uh, we are located in North America, and I am also the North American representative to the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. Uh, so I am here as a guest for a film festival tomorrow on, on North American indigenous peoples. And um, I do have a quick comment, unless you have a question. Uh, for our Yes, I, I did. Uh, from the Mohawk Nation. And maybe they would like to introduce themselves, please. Uh, Sego, good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Yogyok Kwaloni. I possess the Mohawk Nation, upstate New York in Canada. It's an honor to be here with my wife from the Taino Nation, Gayadini. Can you please stand up? <laughs> Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Garayani. I would like to ask you uh, what you think of this celebration, because it's not viewed through uh, what happened to you, you people, to your people, and uh, the history of your people. Well, I think the celebration could be, can be, and will be a very positive uh, celebration in, in the eyes of indigenous peoples, as long as we are invited to be a part of it. And I think that that can be very easily done. Um, for instance, uh, tomorrow uh, we plan on uh, giving to the vice mayor at the film festival a replica of the covenant that we shared with the Dutch people in 1613, which was a covenant based on peace and friendship. And as mentioned by the speakers earlier, uh, there were interesting parallels going on in North America. One was, was commerce. So it was by no mistake that in 1613 an agreement had to be made so that those that were in charge of North America, the indigenous peoples, uh, would allow the Dutch to go through our territory in peace. So we already established a relationship of peace and friendship and we would like to re-acknowledge that relationship. So 
Uh, the Dutch people might think that uh, you may be small, but you have a very huge presence in the United States, especially New York. So we would like to renew that friendship. So that's a message maybe to the Minister of European Affairs. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And one, one more quick question. Is this a celebration for you as well, or is it also a period of total misery? Oh no, the, the, this is something that we would like to think about in terms of rethinking history and thinking about the friendship that we established. And the last speaker talked about tolerance and diversity. And this is something that the Iroquois people brought forward. And my brother is going to be talking about that tomorrow. Um, and I'm going to let the organizer, Leo, tell you wh exactly where that is. Uh, that will be in Smart Space Cinema, Wester Gasthuis. Thank you very much. So everybody is invited who can come there. I don't know if you have so many seats, but thank you very much. <laughs> then the next speaker I would like to... Oh, question over there. Well, my name is Tamara de Calatai, and um, you can find me on the internet as Out of the Box Inside. And I thank you very much for what you said about the divine cosmos and the order. But isn't this exactly the crossroad that we're on? We are in a moment that people are making a new leap in enlightenment and that it's exactly our minds that we are now exploring. It's a cognitive evolution. This is what's going on, not only in America, but globally you see people discovering the power of now, of the moment. All the problems are connected, and there's no, I think, uh, coincidence between the rise of consciousness and the arrival of internet. And I mean, our city logo is even, I am, I am Amsterdam, I am the universe, the wholeness. So it's just a thought, but... I would like to think that we're making a, a new leap in enlightenment, but, but I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm not so sure when I read the headlines. Well, it's even on the dollar note. <laughs> a pluribus... Unum, yeah. you know, from many into mm -hmm. one, and that's the oneness. So. Next question, over there. Yeah, just a, <coughs> a short one. I think it's uh, to Mr. Shardo, uh, but Mr. Mark, feel free. Um, what I think changed most in the recent years is, is that lacks that um, things which were left out of history have been discovered by the New Net Netherlands projects and the way you wrote about it, and a whole new understanding um, about these things. And I remember Mr. Shordo saying the, on, on Dutch television, yeah, history is written by the... Um, the winners. Sorry? By the winners. By the winners, exactly. And, but, but the same pattern, it, I mean, it, it, it evolved in so many other features that I, I really felt it was one of, the, one of the better projects. Just to show what I think and hope has happened in the meantime, since you wrote your book, is uh, I will just read out one sentence of the preface of um, Mr. a book by Mr. Neil Ferguson. I think you know your colleague. I mean, he's widely acclaimed. Um, it's a good book. It's called Empire, about the British Empire. And then he goes into comparing would the world have been different without the British Empire? And he says, yes, it would. For instance, and then he says, and this was just one year before your book was published, so give him a break. But um, he said, would New Amsterdam be New York we, knew t we know today, if the Dutch had not surrendered it to the British, surrendered it to the British in 1664, might it not more closely resemble Bloemfontein, an authentic survivor of Dutch colonialism? It's so the other way around, and this it's, 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 it's is so typically writing history from, from, from one viewpoint. My question is, sorry, I'm too okay. late. My question is, do you see any evidence of things like this changing? Well, I, I, I'm not sure it's completely uh, uh, the other way around. I would say that uh, who we are is, is, is based on a thousand, a million different uh, events in the past. And particularly in the case of New York, I think it was the luckiest thing in the world for New York that it was first uh, New Amsterdam and was a node on the Dutch Empire at the time the empire was at its height and then it was passed over to the English just as the English Empire was rising and for a long period of time it remained an important shipping point 
in both of those empires. So I, 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 it's, to me, it's not the Dutch or the English. It's all of those forces and how they, how they played out over time. Okay. Thank you. Uh, please uh, hold on to your question because I want to go to the next uh, speaker who is Marjorie Ames, the U.S. Consul General. And uh, she previously served in the U.S. Foreign Service in Moscow and London. And also, as I want to go to the next uh, speaker, who is Marjorie Ames, the U.S. Consul General. And uh, she previously served in the U.S. Foreign Service in Moscow and London, and also in Paramaribo. Dus we, u kunt het ook in het Nederlands, geloof ik, hè? Ja, een klein beetje kan, kan ik in het Nederlands spreken. Maar uh, ik denk dat er een heleboel Engelse sprekers hier vanavond zijn. Dus uh, ga ik een beetje verder. Zullen we het even testen? Even kijken hoeveel... Uh, <laughs> testen? How, how many testen? <laughs> how many people are here from uh, England or the U.S.? English speakers, Mike, how many do we have? please raise your hand. <laughs> okay. Yes. So please go on in, in English. Thank you, well, Tuan. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Russell Shorto, a little bit earlier this evening, talked about the need to reteach history. And I grew up in upstate New York. And I must say that growing up in upstate New York, the Native American heritage of that region is all around you in the names of the places, in social traditions, and something that's much less apparent is the impact that the, the Dutch had on, on New York. Uh, but one thing that struck me as I was prefer preparing for this week was that growing up, one thing that I did, that my family did, that our community always did was skate. We always skated in the winter. And we skated on the Erie Canal. And if you read Russell's book, you'll understand the uh, connections between the New Netherlands settlement in New Amsterdam and the development of the United States in large part due to waterways and the development of the Erie Canal and the expansion of the West. But perhaps I'm falling into my own trap, uh, and that is to not look back at history with a romantic eye. I think it's temp tempting to think about the Henry Hudson voyage in a very romantic way, hardy bands of men and women setting off on a grand adventure across the ocean into an unknown future, a wilderness, a fertile soil and abundant animals, strange beasts, a marvelous landscape of towering trees and beautiful mountains and hills and valleys, rivers and streams. Carving out a new home in a vast, wild continent was undoubtedly an adventure, yet we've got to remember that there were considerable hardships involved for anyone facing the exploration or settlement of this new land, settling the world that was new to Europeans during Henry Hudson's time. Conditions above the, aboard the Hall of Man were undoubtedly horrific. Transatlantic journeys were dangerous. The perils of the wilderness were real. Winters in New York unforgiving and the, uh, and the East Coast along where the Dutch settled. Yet somehow a patchwork of individuals and families drawn from different backgrounds, different lands, speaking different languages, honoring different religions, came together to form communities in this wilderness. And most notably, they built the community on the southern tip of the island of Manhattan, which grew and grew into New Amsterdam and now into the glory that we know as New York. In our, in our modern lives here in Amsterdam, it might seem a little quaint to us to think about building our own homes or having to gather our own food. I think probably the best that people can manage living in the centrum is uh, maybe a window box with some herbs or some potted plants uh, for vegetables on the terrace. We can't even imagine what it must have been like to, in some, some cases, have to leave to find a better future, to seek opportunity away from everything you know. And the levels of disease and infant mortality that plagued early settlers are really unthinkable to us today. But each time has its own hardships, and this is something that Minister Timmermans also referred to. Some, like poverty and deprivation, endure. Yet in each time, we find the courage and ingenuity and the sheer will to overcome the perils we face. Tonight, 
is part of a wider celebration of the Dutch contributions to the American creed that have helped both our nations triumph over adversity and mark the enduring relationship between the US and the Kingdom of the Netherlands. Celebrations of the Dutch role in the founding of New York and the profound influence that that settlement had on the United States were held twice in the last century. And in 1909, New York City hosted what was then expected to be the largest celebration in the history of that city. The people that watched the massive flotilla of ships attended the gala dinners and looked at a spectacular fireworks display during the two weeks of celebrations in New York City in that year. They could hardly have anticipated the changes that were to take place across the century. Two people in 1909 actually did reach poles. They weren't in ships, which is why they were able to reach them. Uh, in fact, in 1909, that was the first year that the Elf Stedetocht was held. And uh, in the years to come, there was considerable hardship. There was a worldwide pandemic influenza that killed millions of people. The stock market crashed. The depression brought ruination, but it also brought structural and economic changes. We fought two world wars and subsequently built the modern security relationship between the United States and Europe that we are celebrating today in Strasbourg. Today's challenges are stark, and they would defy the belief of the people of the early 20th century. Those 1909 celebrants could hardly have imagined the develop of development of new medicines and vaccines to cure and prevent diseases, discoveries from the smallest elements of matter to the building blocks of life, to the vastness of space, have revolutionized our thinking in this century. And mass air, sea, and train travel, along with the uh, growth of the personal auto, have made the world a lot smaller. What would an early 20th century New Yorker or Amsterdamer make of television, computers, mobile phones, CDs, DVDs, Blu-ray, iPods, Facebook, Twitter, or Facebook? or YouTube. This year's celebra year celebration in implements and integrates a lot of those technologies with tr a transatlantic video feed to launch this year, blogging, social networking sites, viral advertising. For those of you who saw the stat Statues of Liberty walking around the streets, you know what I mean. And the John Adams Institute's own digital historical project called The Island which will engage a new generation of, of kids in both the United States and the Netherlands in the exploration of our joint history. More traditional commemorations like this meeting honor our past and invite people to explore what it means for our future. Yesterday, I had the great pleasure of meeting some new pioneers from Amsterdam and New York. They're gathered here to not only celebrate our shared values, our passion for tolerance, our love of freedom, our search for opportunity. They are also exploring the new frontiers of civic engagement. And I was also very fortunate to be able to attend a meeting of some other pioneers, uh, young professionals drawn from both Dutch and American companies to get together and share their experiences working in a global mobile environment and just to learn a little bit more about each other. We need more of this. We need more of these contacts. We need more of this exchange. This is what is going to guide us into the, new fa the next phase of our history. I can't possibly predict, I would not presume to know, what the world will be like when our successors gather to celebrate the next centennial of Henry Hudson's voyage to the New World. But what I do know is that the investment that we make today will shape the relationship between the United States and the Netherlands over the next century, and that is an investment worth making. There was a gentleman over there who wanted to ask a question. I don't know if you're still here. Yes. 
Thank you. Uh, Ryan Kelly, visiting from Brooklyn. Question for you, Russell. Um, it, one of the n two notions that you mentioned uh, as exports of Dutch thought to the would-be Americans was the idea of free trade. And I, I thought about the irony of how the last 50, 60 years, we've, uh, uh, the Americans have then been attempting to sell their own version of this uh, free trade back to mm -hmm. the continent of Europe until last year, you know, mm -hmm. until now. And I, I wonder, uh, these meetings that are happening this past week and, and today, it's so interesting um, as we're moving on to a new idea of um, American enterprise. I wonder how an understanding of Dutch Enlightenment thought, of how Dutch Enlightenment thought shaped American thought might guide us now as we're reconsidering our role in the world and particularly our economic role in the world. Um, oh, I'll be happy to say something. I think Kurt might um, say something more intelligent. Um, but yeah, I think that's a very good point that um, particularly look at, the, at what the U.S. is trying to do to struggle with as it struggles with uh, its economic situation is that it seems still largely to be caught in, in an old approach, in an old paradigm. Um, and maybe one way out is to back up, go all the way back and say, look at w how we did it, how people did it in the 17th century. Look at how it developed. You know, and and that look what, as uh, Margie referring to, the after the Depression, how things had to be reorganized and, and sort of systematically uh, examine how we got where we are and where what these places were where you had, to, you had to come up with a new, as, as the woman said, a new kind of enlightenment. Um, so maybe something like that is called for, but th I'm just talking, you know, I'm talking airily here. I'm not an economist. Kurt, would you like to say something? I think, I I think you, you must not idealize the, the, this time of, of enlightenment. That was a fantastic theory. And uh, there were quite a lot of people were uh, indeed obsessed by it. And uh, also, uh, with in that time still, uh, the feeling, it was a, a, a combination of enlightenment, but also with, uh, with an important part that was still religious. Uh, I said, but the combination of looking for the divine harmony in nature and in the world. Um, but on the other hand, uh, all these nice uh, ideas were um, were invented in a city in which uh, when you uh, which wrote Descartes also literally everybody is here only talking about money <laughs> uh, and that was around 1630 uh, it was an, an, a one big business machine and uh, uh, so it was double yeah, it's mentioned before here already, at, at, uh, and also when we talked about the, all those uh, slave transport and the slave business, and uh, uh, it, it was full of uh, 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 yeah, double uh, morality. So I think it is not enough to look back to the 17th century. It is sometimes, and, and some independent thinkers can inspire you, inspire you, especially because they were so independent. And in their feeling of freedom and in their struggle for freedom, uh, uh, they, they can be still very inspiring. But on the other hand, I think we really, we are living in the 21st century and we are so terribly connected with each other that uh, this is really a new area. The only thing I, I can say about is that Perhaps, like someone said before already, I've personally the feeling that that we are in a, in a, in a phase of history, which looks a little bit like the uh, middle of the 16th century. Uh, in a, in a, we are we are in. A, I, I, I have often the idea that the old ways of thinking, in, I'm afraid, included enlightenment, included even democracy values of the West are changing in the 21st century and I I'm, I'm don't hope it but perhaps declining or changing. We are coming into an area w in which suddenly new paradigmata can develop. The same kind of periods like you had at the end of the medieval time. But we are 
but it's the only a feeling. It is a theory of the, 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 the American historian John Lukács, and I, I agree with him in that, but it is more intuition than anything else. Thanks very much. Uh, one more question here, and then we go to the next speaker. Yes. About paradigms. The International Forum on Globalization uh, a few years ago released a book called Paradigm Wars. And it sets next to each other the paradigm of the Western industrialized world and the paradigm of indigenous peoples. And there are some remarkable differences in those paradigms. For instance, we think nature belongs to us, the ratio, the enlightenment. Indigenous people say we belong to nature. We think of the next, uh, of this afternoon stock market rates. Indigenous people think of the seventh generation ahead. What, what does it imply for them what we do today? So I think including indigenous peoples in, in our discussions can be very beneficial for us. Would you agree? <laughs> yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> Shortest answer available. Eh? Yeah. Next speaker is Sam Roberts. He has been a reporter for the New York Times since 1983. He has won several awards reporting on um, stuff like uh, streetlights and uh, the race for the mayor. And he recently touched off a controversy surrounding the founding of New Amsterdam. So that will be interesting. I don't know where Sam is. Oh, here you are. Sorry. Before you start, um, we are talking about the economical crisis. Is New York in the mood for a celebration? Uh, New York needs a celebration. Okay. <laughs> there you go. So thank you for this opportunity to, uh, to give us an excuse for one. Uh, thanks to Russell and the John Adams Institute for inviting me. Uh, I did uh, get involved in a controversy over numbers, and that was when the Dutch actually founded New York, when New York's birthday is officially. The New York City flag says it's 1625, but in fact that number was changed because an Irish politician in New York really wanted to stick it to the British and changed the date on the flag from 1664 when the British took over New York to 1625. Now the controversy is should it really be 1625 or 1624 or 1626? These are the weighty matters I deal in uh, as a New York Times reporter. Uh, <laughs> I spent a lot of time dealing with numbers and in, uh, in our work in a ever-changing world, I think we're looking for consistency, for reliable benchmarks. And I've learned that numbers, as with the flag dispute, tend to uh, create a false precision. I was once working on a story about the gender gap in various New York City neighborhoods. In certain neighborhoods, particularly black and poor neighborhoods, there are many more women than men. And I wanted to find the most vivid example of this to write about, of course. So I found one uh, where women, there were about 142 women, according to the census, and only six men. And it was one of those eureka moments in journalism. This is it. This will get this story onto the front page. So I went up to the, uh, the site of this small area in the Bronx, and it turned out to be a convent. <laughs> Uh, numbers, numbers do provide a skeletal framework, though, for who we are as a city and as a nation uh, 400 years after the first Dutch were greeted somewhat ambivalently by the native Indians. Uh, besides the heritage of narrow streets in lower Manhattan, of bowling, of coleslaw, of iconic names like Brooklyn, Harlem, the Yankees, the Roosevelts, New York, precisely because we were first Dutch, is the most diverse city in the world. It's a city of superlatives. 400 years later, New York is home to more American Indians and more people of Dutch descent than any big city in the United States. It's home to more people born in every country in the world, except primarily for Cuba and Mexico, than any place in America. And of course, numbers just tell part of that story. Two years ago, at precisely the moment that the Census Bureau predicted that the 300 millionth American would be born, Emmanuel Plata was born in New York City in a hospital in Queens. His parents were Mexican immigrants. His, uh, one of the doctors who delivered him was from Argentina. 
He was assisted by two nurses. One of them was from Russia, another one was from India, and the anesthesiologist was from Bulgaria. That is a very much New York story. And talk about assimilation. In Texas nowadays, the number one name among all newborn boys is Jose, not surprisingly. In New York, among Hispanic babies, the most popular names are Ashley and, thank you, Britney Spears and Will Smith, Jaden. The most popular names among Asian newborns in New York City, Sophia and Ryan. Uh, now, in New York City, if you're a motorist, you have to move your car uh, every day or so so they can clean the streets. To me, the most finely calibrated test of political power is your success in persuading the city council to suspend alternate side parking regulations to allow for the street cleaning. Newer immigrants have been so successful in assimilating that in addition to all of those national, Christian, Jewish holidays, no New Yorker, regardless of his or her heritage, has to move his car on the Asian Lunar New Year, <laughs> the Hindu Festival of Lights, and on six Muslim holy days. <laughs> now, we're reminded, of course, by today's headlines from upstate New York that there is no single perfect formula for assimilating immigrants. America has always been evolving, and the poetry of Emma Lazarus on the Statue of Liberty notwithstanding, the nation has always been ambivalent about welcoming newcomers. Benjamin Franklin feared that his fellow Pennsylvanians, many of them of Dutch descent, would be overwhelmed by what he called swarthy Germans, who he said, quote, will soon so outnumber us that all the advantages we have will not, in my opinion, be able to preserve our language and even our government will become precarious. The changes that we're still going through are prompting us to take a new look at categories that are often the result of self-identification and involve much more culture than biology. According to the federal government, the definition of whites in the United States now they are officially defined as descendants of, quote, the original peoples of Europe, North Africa, or the Middle East. New York is losing American-born blacks and gaining immigrants from sub-Sahara Africa. What does that mean for the way black defi blacks define themselves and how the rest of society defines African-Americans? The number of babies being born now to Hispanic mothers in the United States has surpassed the number of new Hispanic immigrants. That means a growing proportion of people described as Hispanic or Latino are being raised as Americans from birth. Now, the census predicts that blacks, Hispanics, Asians will constitute a majority of the nation's children under 18 by 2023, of working age Americans by 2039, and of all Americans by 2042. But I discovered another fascinating statistic. Since most Hispanic people define themselves as white, the United States will be home to 80 million more white people by the middle of the century. And the proportion who define themselves as white will barely shrink at all. 2009 is the centennial also of Israel Zangwill's play, The Melting Pot. It premiered in New York, it popularized that term. And he wrote, what is the glory of Rome and Jerusalem, where all nations and races come to worship and look back, compared with the glory of America, where all races and nations come to labor and look forward? On one visit, Zangwill berated New Yorkers for post-World War I restrictions on immigration. You shut out immigrants instead of holding out hospitable hands, he wrote. And how did you get your country? You took it by force from the Indians. And your duty is to hold it in trust for humanity. You call it God's own country. For God's sake, make it so. Two years ago, America celebrated the birth of Jamestown, the first permanent English colony it was called. A friend of Russell's and mine, Ken Jackson, a professor at Columbia, didn't begrudge Jamestown that celebration. But he said, just to correct the record, in Jamestown, they discover a town that disappears into the mud. New York becomes the greatest city in the world. The Hudson becomes the river west 
the river of empire. More than ever, New York, I think, is a model for America, the America that it's becoming, managing diversity, as in the rest of the world, may become the chief challenge we face in the 21st century in America and in New York. America, <coughs> Ken Jackson likes to say, begins in New York. This year, happily, we're reminded how much New York began with the Dutch. And for that, I say, thank you. Please wait a second. <laughs> I, was, I was just wondering if you have an explanation to the question, how come that so many uh, people live in this city from all over the world, in New York City, and it never leads to a conflict? Well, it does lead to a conflict. Uh, there are conflicts, but in fact, we get along remarkably well. And the reason for that, I think, is in part, and this is a little different from Amsterdam, there is no one majority in New York City. There has not been for a while whites, blacks, Asians, Hispanics, however we define all those groups, have each now become a minority. So in, one, in some ways, none is particularly threatening to the other. And it is a city of commerce. It is a city where people come to realize the dreams for themselves and for their children. And for that fact alone, people realize they have to be tolerant of each other, even if they don't necessarily want to all the time. Clear. Thank you. Any questions? Here is a question. Hi, my name is Martine Gosselink. Um, I would like to ask you, Russell or Mr. Mack, uh, to enlighten us, the audience, a little bit more on the idea of um, tolerance. Because you already mentioned in your speech that um, it is a concept of relatively tolerance. And uh, we all know that um, in the 17th century, there was a big lack of labor. So we needed those immigrants from, from other countries. and it's not really, not really have to, having to do with uh, yeah, the unique selling point of tolerance. So that's what my question to you, if you could help us a little bit. And need, it needs more ex um, explanation, I think. First of all, I'd just like to point out Martina Hoslink is the organizer of exhibit, an exhibit which is one of the uh, 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 wellstones of this year, exhibit uh, that will be, that it's, that it's in Amsterdam now and will move to uh, New York uh, and this, the center of it is the uh, Peter Schagen letter. Um, uh, Franz Timmermans, uh, maybe I could a turn that question over to you. Um, in particular, there was something, there was one particular point in your talk that I thought, uh, that I never thought of that in quite the way that you uh, presented it, and that was um, uh, you talked about um, uh, both c the, the, the Netherlands and the U.S. being strong moral countries, and of course, to a lot of outsiders thinking of the Netherlands, and they think of sex and drugs, and you know, it seems the opposite. But living here, you really get that sense, and you related that to tolerance. So maybe you could talk about that. But but it's it's morality in a different form. But it's yeah. still feeling very strongly about what we think is right. Yeah. Um, and Sam's point about New York not having a majority dominating uh, uh, min minorities is exactly um, correct for the Netherlands and Amsterdam through the ages. The reason why we were tolerant is because no minority was big enough to impose its ideas on the others and no minority was so small that it could be suppressed completely by the others. So it was always a balancing act. It was, in, in that sense, it wasn't moral at all. And, and to look, look, at, look at our, I mean, I, I'm from a Roman Catholic background, but look at the Protestants in this country. If the Protestants disagreed on the issue whether the snake had spoken in paradise, you know, if they disagreed on that, they started a new church because they just couldn't tolerate a difference of opinion on such an issue within their one church. So I'm all on your side when you say that you should put this tolerance into perspective. Tolerance was also, uh, I don't want to be bothered by the others. You know, grant me my freedom and I'll grant you yours. Uh, and, and this is at the root of our problems we have today because that tolerance has as its pivotal center indifference to the other. So now in a modern society where you cannot live without contact with the other and your starting point is that you are through the ages indifferent to the other, you get into trouble, and that's why we're in trouble today in Dutch society. So, so that would be my pitch on tolerance, which is not this rosy image of we all love each other and let's hug and kiss. 
It's rather a, a situation where you accept difference in society because that's the only way you can manage society. So you're saying part of the difficulty that the, the, the Netherlands has now it stems from the verzouwling system, from oh, this, the idea of pillars and we'll, we'll tolerate everybody as long as we've sort of put well, them into the, separate... When, when, we, when we started to create this nation, which was created in the 19th century, and we, we invented this pillarization, uh, the verzouwling, it is precisely for this point. I don't want to be bothered by the others. Let them do their thing, let them live the way they like, but don't you, know, don't you come on my front door and, and ask me to be interested in how you live. So that's how we organize society. And, and you know, uh, the leaders of the Zaulen, of the pillars, they agreed on things and they negotiated, but people in the pillars never saw each other. I was nine or 10 years old when my grandmother said for the first time, look at those people walking here, the Protestants. And I, you know, I looked and I saw they had two arms, two legs, and they looked like nice people, but you know, we never met. You must know something about that. We're from the same region. <laughs> exactly the same region, yes. <laughs> um, let's introduce the next speaker, <coughs> Ruth Olenziel. Many people know her here. She is uh, one of the uh, country's leading voices on America and professor at Eindhoven University and the University of Amsterdam. Please welcome Ruth Olenziel. First of all, I want to thank uh, Russell Shorto for inviting me uh, to be part of this conversation. He asked me specifically to talk about contemporary issues. And I was listening to all the speakers before me, and I'm really struck that I'm probably the only really certified historian, but I must say I've never heard journalists and politicians uh, and um, uh, government officials speak so passionately about history. And so I am going to talk about something that I don't know anything about, and that's the <laughs> contemporary is issue, and it's going to be personal in a way. So it's very nice company. Um, I'm transported back to one of the first times, I think many of you, the first time to, you come to New York as an Amsterdammer, and you think, you feel at home. You feel at home, but you don't know why. And I think Russell and Geert are the two people who have given talk back to us, uh, and trying to give us some piece of that history of why it is the affinity that we feel between these two cities. I want to go back through the prism of looking through the city, through these societies. Of course, when I'm asked to talk about international relations between the United States and the Netherlands, we speak in very traditional terms. International relations is usually the business between sovereign nation states in which diplomacy takes place between heads of states. But as scholars and historians find, the nation state it has really turned to an analytical headache. It fails to capture what goes on on many levels. And if we look at history, the labor movement, the anti-slavery movement, feminism, modern architecture, or the age of discoveries like Hudson, we learn that these movements knew no national bounds. People and knowledge easily moved across na national boundaries. They were profoundly international and transnational in their orientation. And it's very hard from the 20th century, after the Cold War, after the age of nationalism, to think about the era when nation states really didn't have a place. Now the man who represents this best of all, not only Henry Hudson, who was born in Britain, worked for the Dutch VOC, died on Canadian soil, is of course President Barack Obama. By birth and biography, we all know this story very well, Barack Obama is an internationalist and a cosmopolitan. He was born in Hawaii from a, a Kansian mother and a Kenyan father, raised in Indonesia in the Midwest and married and politically matured in Chicago. 
And I think we all can agree it's a sheer joy to see this man with the level of comfort entering the international world stage this past week. More importantly, I think, is that Barack Obama is also a new and proud urbanist who lived in Jakarta, Boston, DC, Chicago. He enjoys these cities, what they have to offer, a pickup game, a basketball, or an ethnic meal on the restaurant row. Obama may be the first proudly, as somebody called it, the Metropolitan American president. Not just a, res a, a resident of the city, but an intellectual up to date on the latest thinking in the urban planning, the challenge to overcome the traditional divisions, real or imagined, between cities, suburbs, exurbs, to explore regional policies and transit uh, strategies. Unlike his predecessors, who have used the White House as a bullhorn for small town America, Obama expresses the lifestyle of an urban dweller. And miracles of miracles, Barack Obama allowed himself to be photographed on, lo and behold, a bike. With yes, uh, to shock to most Dutch people, with a helmet. Uh, this was a lot of debate within his campaign, but this was daring. I think, thanks to uh, Geert and Russell, we can appreciate uh, the era in which um, people were much more profoundly cosmopolitan and, and um, were part of an, an Atlantic world. We are reminded of the generations of the 1920s, of progressives like Rexel uh, Tuxwell. They were probably the last generations of Americans who looked to European cities as social laboratories and as sources of inspiration. The American progressive movement and the New Deal that followed had deep international transatlantic roots when it came to city planning and social policy. But the 1940s, we saw already charges of un-Americanism had already seeped into the American political discourse. And although American progressives did retain a cosmopolitan outlook, they started to exhibit great caution in quoting European experience or European ways of meeting problems. And we all remember, of course, that era not so long ago when French fries were to be called freedom fries as the ultimate test of Americanism. But here we are again, almost a century later, and urbanism and urb European ways of life may be fashionable again in the era of Obama. Echoes of that earlier age. The new vogue of urbanism is not the urbanism of the inner city poverty, crime, joblessness we associate with the Johnson administration, for example. This is a new urbanism. It's about new uses of space, of human geography. It advocates urban farming, turning American lawns into vegetable gardens or letting cows pasture in the Stadsdeel de Baarsjes, as some architects have envisioned. Is it, these are people who advocate an anti-car uh, city, densely built cities with environmental justice. It's about renewable energy, electric transportation. But foremost, these are walkable and bikeable cities. This is an urbanism of New York, a major Michael Bloomberg, who encourages bike lanes after the European examples of Chicago, Richard Daly, who is greening roofs in Chicago uh, as a way to fight urban heat islands after elderly died in a heat wave. And this was an example taken from Stuttgart. Uh, in, a, in for the first time, uh, European examples are fashionable again. These are men with a regional worldview who understand that compact communities emit less carbon than suburbia. They approach problems not necessarily through the prism of the nation state, but through the cities as part of global nodes. America's newfound urbanism 
could be the next tool for transatlantic relations. I would call that bicycle diplomacy. Here is a chance to set Dutch-American relations, or better still, New York-Amsterdam relations on a new path, a bicycle path. There's a new way um, to craft international, transnational solutions through another vector of diplomacy, that of inter-municipal, transnational governance, the kinds of people that Marjorie Ames talked about, the pioneers who look at um, the landscape through the urban lens. It is in cities rather than national governments that have come together to fight climate change. It is in cities in the tradition of the Dutch urban development that have been the birthday place of diversity. And as the Dutch know, bikes, the idea, and the technological grids that sustain them, bikes are our best defense for healthy lives and sustainable communities. They're, to me, the symbols of a um, new uh, sustainable community, uh, freedom from uh, oil dependency, dense livable cities, uh, low tech but very sophisticated. It has been said, and it has become a cliche from Clinton to Bush, that democracy offered the best defense against war because democracies don't go to war with each other. So here's my solution for the next 400 years of U.S.-Dutch relations. Bikes, bikes, bikes. Thank you. Any questions? Otherwise, we go to the last speaker of the night, who was born and raised in New York City, uh, living in the East Village, I think, Beth Fertig. She works for a radio station in uh, New York, which is probably comparable to Radio 1 in the Netherlands. But there it's called WNYC. It's uh, very popular. She covers uh, city schools and transportations and many more subjects. And she won several awards for her work. So welcome to the stage, Beth. Thank you. As it was pointed out, um, I actually live in an apartment building facing Stuyvesant Park, where hit you'll be hit you'll be glad to know that there is a Quaker meeting house on that park. <laughs> and I work in an office building on the corner of Van Dam Street, so I think about the Dutch quite often. I cover the public schools in New York City for WNYC, which I, my bosses would like me to tell you is the largest public radio station in the United States. I was asked to talk about diversity in our public schools. New York City is the largest city in the United States, and it has more than a million students attending 1,500 schools. 14% of these students are what we call English language learners. That means they were either born in another country that doesn't speak English, or they grew up in a household that doesn't speak English, even if they were born in the US. There are 150 languages spoken in the public schools. Most, the most common ones are Chinese, Spanish, Bengali, and now Arabic. Arabic speakers are a very, very small proportion of the public school students, just 4,000 4, or so speak Arabic, but their population has been growing. Some English language learners do very well academically. We have a long history of immigrants who have succeeded in New York who came from nowhere and spoke no English. But only about 25% of English language learners graduate high school in the optimal period of four years. That's very low. That's half the regular percentage, which is also quite low. The lower graduation rates and test scores are pretty common throughout the United States for English language learners, not just New York. I just finished writing a book about three students, three former students, who got all the way to high school without learning to read. That means they were 17, 18, 19, and they never learned to read in the public schools. It just so happens that they were all the children of immigrants from the Dominican Republic. That is not typical. This is an exceptional, extraordinary situation that they found themselves in. All three of these students had learning disabilities. They had dyslexia, and their learning disabilities were never treated. They came to the United States, two of them came to the United States when they were very young, and they had no formal education back home in the Dominican Republic. The book is called Why Can't You Teach Me to Read? It's coming out in September. 
just so you remember. <laughs> These three students experienced the worst thing that could ever happen to an immigrant in New York. And as I said, that's not typical. They fell between the cracks. And because their parents had no formal education, they couldn't help them navigate the hierarchy of public education. And that's a common story that I've also heard here in my brief visit in meeting with students and teachers at a school here, that immigrants often don't know how to navigate the system if they didn't grow up here and they don't speak the language. The New York City schools have several different programs for English language learners. They could take classes in English with some extra support in their native language. That's called English as a Second Language. They can take bilingual classes where they're taught in their native language so they can not fall behind in math or science and then gradually they're all taught in English. We have another popular program now called Dual Language, which is for all students. So there could be students who speak Spanish taking classes with native born students who don't speak Spanish just so that they can learn from each other. A lot of parents like that. And the city schools all tend to really celebrate diversity. Whenever I travel to the public schools, you'll see that they'll celebrate holidays of children from other countries. A school in Washington Heights in Upper Manhattan, which has a lot of Dominican students, will have books by Dominican authors in the English language class so that they're reading the books in English, but they're by Dominican authors. And it, it's to give them a feeling of validity and that they're all part of the whole system together. They'll celebrate holidays, whether it's Chinese New Year, just as we do with you know what Sam said with the parking rules. Everyone's recognized in the schools. And I want to tell you about another really interesting program. This is where my presentation is going to get multimedia. It's called the International High School. The city has nine of these schools. The first one opened about 24 years ago in Queens during an immigration boom. The students are teenagers who have been in the United States for four years or less. And they don't speak much English. So they're all thrown into the same school together. And you'll have students from Bangladesh, Nepal, China, Haiti, Africa, Eastern Europe, all studying together. Even though they don't speak any English, they'll learn English together because it's the, the only common language they can communicate in. And they get a little bit more flexibility on the testing requirements to help them out. But all told, these schools tend to have higher graduation rates than average. I believe about 66% of their students will graduate in four years, which is better than the average citywide, which is about 52%. There's also an international school now in Oakland, California, which copied the model in New York. I'm going to show you a short video, which I think sort of captures the flavor. It's a, it's a theater class, not an academic class. It's from the International High School at LaGuardia Community College in Queens. And this is a school that embraces diversity by everyone learning from each other. So the students in this class, it's a theater class, as I said, they were asked to bring a little rap or hip hop music from their native country and to then explain what it means in English. I've just been told that we don't have sound on the video. There's no so sound on the video. The <laughs> OK, well, you can envision that. <laughs> so um, <laughs> what you would have seen was a, a kid from Albania explaining what his Albanian rap song meant to students from Nepal and Tibet and the Dominican Republic and Colombia. Uh, I do have sound, if not video. The students I met at this school really enjoyed learning from each other. And uh, they acknowledge, though, that this is not your typical American high school experience because there's not any native-born English speakers there with them. So it's not high school USA, as you would call it. And one student who I spoke to, his name is 15-year-old Osman Zulago from Colombia. Here's what he had to say about that. Osman Zulago uh, from norm, Colombia. In a regular junior high school, I learned a lot of English over there. And uh, I also think that and this school is nice. I love the school because I, like, I, I, lo I love the schedule and everything. But I, sometimes I think that it would be better. I'd be better if I was in regular school school because I would be learning more English and I'd improve my English pretty much. So like I was in a norm in a regular junior high school, I learned a lot of English over there. Okay. 
okay. And uh, we don't I have to hear it again. That, uh, <laughs> and this clue is nice. So, I love this clue because I like I, I love I love this kid. So what you heard him say was he acknowledged if he was in a regular school, he might have learned English a little faster, but he still liked the school. One of his classmates, 18-year-old Stephanie St. Val of Haiti, disagreed with him because she suggested that maybe Spanish speakers weren't learning as fast because there were a lot of Spanish speakers at the school and they can all kind of hang out together. But she said to me that there are not a lot of kids from Haiti at the school. Here's Stephanie. Only one person in the school speak Creole, so that pushed me more to speak English. So if I was in another school, it would be harder. And especially the program that they have, this school have a good program, like an ESL program. It's good. I learned English in like six months. I, I, didn't, I only know good morning, goodbye. That's all. <laughs> so she thought that she learned really quickly by being there. And I guess the lesson from all of this is that these are the voices of students who are learning what it means to become an American, and there's no one way. I would, I would like to ask you, um, that is New York, are the New Yorkers already aware of this Hudson year? Are you reporting on it, and are people, have they got any idea that it's coming up? They don't know what's coming yet. <laughs> but it, there will be much coverage in the months ahead, I believe. It's just starting to sink in right now. There hasn't been much publicity yet. Have you done anything on your radio station about this already? We will on Monday, <laughs> when I get back. <laughs> okay. Any questions here? Uh, we're almost closing this session, so uh, this is your chance. Please come to the microphone. Or I'll come to you. It's maybe easier. Thank you. Well, we hear a lot about the history of 1609, the last 400 years of what took place between the Dutch, the Netherlands, different countries around the world. But we never really get a traditional Native American perspective on what happened when the Dutch arrived on our shores. Now, I grew up in Mohawk territory. We call that Ganyang Gehagas. We are the Haudenosaunee. In my language, it's the Haudenosaunee. We are the people of the Long House, the people of a great league of peace, which had an inspiration on the establishment of the United States of America. And a lot of that history started in New Amsterdam, New York City, the place they call the Empire State that derived its sustenance from the indigenous people of New York State. But from a Native American perspective, when we go back into our history, we have to rely on our oral traditions. The oral traditions of the covenant, the sacred covenant of peace, friendship, and respect that we teach our younger generations for seven generations ahead of time. That's how we think of our future, hundreds of years ahead of our time. Because our history goes back maybe 2,000 years with a sacred Messiah who brought our people's religion, what we call the Guyana Lagoa, the great laws of peace. Democratic principles that gave inspiration to the birth of a new world, which you know as America the Constitution of the United States, influenced by our native leaders, our messiahs, a man that we call Deganoida, the peacemaker, who made sacred covenants to our people and showed our people that if you can build a sacred fire, if you have the power in yourself, in your heart, a sacred covenant with God, with Swungat Diza, our creator, and you can build a fire for your family. Take care of your family. And if you can take care of your people, take care of your clan. Through 400 years, I still have my clan. I belong to the wolf clan. I am a brother to the wolf. The Mohawk people, we have three clans. 
in our sacred covenants that were made with the Dutch people have three principles. Peace, respect, and friendship. We have two rules that that peacemaker taught us to stand by. A sacred agreement that comes from the covenant of your heart. That when you come to our fire, you will set yourself on one side of that fire. And we will be on the other side of that fire. And in that fire, when you come and you sit next to us, you will come representing your people with your government, your traditions and your culture, your religion. That is what you will bring in your great winged canoe. When that great winged canoe came into our territories, they tied their ship to our territories with a great rope. And we knew that that rope could break. So we said, let's make it a chain. And then the Dutch people said, well, a chain can rust. Then we said, let it become the sacred chain of the silver covenant, which we will polish from time to time to remember our Dutch brothers that we can enter into trade and commerce if we understand peace, if we understand respect, and we have friendship in our hearts. This had been going on for probably 1,500 years before the Dutch showed up. 72 Indian nations were brought into our confederacy under a sacred tree of peace that would grow so tall that all the nations could see that tree. And it had four great white roots that would go to the four corners of the world. If any man or any nation wanted to live in peace, that's all they had to do was to follow the roots to its source. And under that source of that great tree of peace, there the Iroquois Confederacy was sitting. A democratic government where women had an equal voice to vote. We are matriarchal. They're the ones that elect our chiefs into position, into authority. And if those chiefs, those governors, are guilty of misconduct, it's the same women our clan mothers who are empowered with that sacred title given to us by the peacemaker who has the power to impeach them for misconduct. That's balance and power within the Iroquois Confederacy. So we have a lot to contribute. And my elders, my leaders, they tell me, you know, whether a lot of these Europeans realize it or not, they may be thinking, acting, and living more like the indigenous people of this land because of the democracy they enjoy today under that great tree of peace. We made a sacred covenant with the Dutch. And it was probably the Dutch that were the only ones that were able to keep that agreement with the Mohawk people. And this we are honored. We are honored to say that. Because back in our old traditions, when I go home into my long haul, my elders, that's what they tell me. The Dutch were able to hold on to that agreement with the Mohawk people. That's how we entered trade and commerce with each other. We tolerated the Dutch. We entered into a sacred covenant with them. We fed you. We took care of your children. We took care of your, your sailors, your, your people that came across them ships. We gave them a home. You learned our ways. You learned our language. You became a true blood brother to the first Native American, that was the Mohawk people. So I feel that there's a lot to be learned from studying the indigenous people who had a great influence on the Dutch. There might not be a 1609 if it was for the Mohawk people. <laughs> there might not be a New York if it wasn't for the Mohawk people, a New Amsterdam. There might not be trade and commerce. There might not be one of the greatest cities in the world. But what's not for the Mohawk people? We have to learn to acknowledge the indigenous people for the contributions that we have made to this world. I have spoken. I think, I think that was a perfect note to end on for several reasons. 
uh, one of which is it is indeed the case that the, the colonists, the colonial leaders looked at the Iroquois League as their model when they were forming uh, the 13 colonies. And a second being that the first record of the League in the first written record of it is in the writings of the Dutch colonists from the 1630s from when they, uh, when they interacted with them. So thank you very much for that. Um, and thank you all very much. This ran a little longer than, than planned, but uh, there, we had a lot of moving parts here. Once again, my thanks to New York 400, the city of Amsterdam, to Echon, the U.S. Embassy, the Holland America Friendship Foundation, the Henry Hudson 400 organization, to Tuan House for moderating with such style, to Franz Timmermans, Sam Roberts, uh, Margie Ames, Beth Fertig, Ruth Oldenziel, my friend Gert Mack, and to Mr. Hudson. Thank you all. Good night.